Joining us now, she's now entering her second season as the head coach at Texas Tech. I speak of Sammy Ward, who's back with us, become a regular on this show, which we enjoy always every time she comes on. Uh, coach, how you doing? I'm great. How you doing, Elo? Doing very good. Let's talk about the last year. Obviously, you came in, took over the program, obviously had to deal with the protocols and COVID right in the middle of it. What Now that you have some time to reflect, uh, when you think back to last year, what were some of the things you learned? Man, I mean, that's exactly what last year was. It was a learning experience. It was um, a learning experience in terms of the Big 12, in terms of Texas Tech, um, in terms of, you know, who we had on the roster, who we have on the roster, um, things like that. But everything about it was the learning experience. And I mean, as a coach, we're always preaching, you know, be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's definitely what last year was. It was uncomfortable, but in those chances or those opportunities, that's the only time we get to grow. So it was uncomfortable, but it was great because we got to grow. And I feel like as leaders, we grew a lot last year. What are some like, what was some of the things you learn about the big 12 in particular? Uh, Cause you kind of start, you kind of, at the end of the year, you kind of had that good run there played well in that big 12 tournament. I thought you had some positive momentum towards the end of the year. What were some of the things you learned about the conference uh, in particular? Cause I think it towards the end, you started to kind of figure some things out, at least it looked like from afar. Yeah. I mean, it's absolutely a competitive conference. We knew that coming into it. Um, I think the biggest thing that we learned as a team and as a program is the, you know, our job is to play the game and play the ball and not play the opponent's Jersey. So I think they're in the conference tournament. We really started to, number one, mix up the lineup. And number two, we had the opportunity to play free. Um, we had some of our younger players who are returning this year really step up. And it was a great experience for them and great experience for our program. And I think it's going to help launch us forward into this year. Yeah, I mean, for those that may not be aware, at the end of the year, you beat Iowa State on the last day of the regular season. You beat Baylor and Texas in the Big 12 tournament played Oklahoma really well. Uh, it was a really close game until the end there. I mean, that, you know, Iowa State was a tournament team. Texas was a tournament team. Baylor tournament, Oklahoma, obviously the national champions. And you played really well in those games. Is that something you think, not you mentioned giving the, the players that are returning some confidence and maybe uh, a momentum going into this season? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, a lot of things. I think a lot of our players really chomping at the bit there at the end last year to prove themselves and make the most of their opportunities, and they did. And I really felt at that moment, you know, a group, a group of them really came together. And we can see that this year. I mean, there's such a different feeling in our program right now. And I know a lot of it was that growth that we had at the conference tournament. And it's not about, you know, us beating those teams at the end, but it's about the belief they have in each other and understanding, communicating, understanding that everyone in our program right now is here to like knowing that their job and our job right now is to build our foundation and build it strong as we move forward. And that's pretty special in today's day and age because a lot of people want the instant gratification and it's like, I'm going to the World Series or bust and you damn well bet that that's our goal too. But they understand that we've got work to do. It's not just going to happen. We're not going to show up on day one and people are going to give it to us. We've got to earn everything we're going to get and we're putting in the work right now preparing to do so of the returners talk about the returners what, what stood out and stood out from them uh that fans can look for that you you've learned get, getting to know them here over the last year of the returners and maybe some of them that are going to become leaders on this year's team you know i think that's the cool thing about leadership it doesn't have to be one person i mean different people can lead at different times as long as uh, we stick to our core values within our program and we understand we're all here to help this thing grow. So um, we had some young ladies really step up at the end of last year. Um, Abby Orrick, she played at every game at third base in our conference tournament and she hit like almost 500 in the tournament. You know, um, I think she should have been an all tournament team, but that, that wasn't my selection to vote, but I, she did a hell of a job for us there. Um, Peyton Jackson had one of the greatest at bats, in my opinion, during the Texas game. She hit a screamer down the line um, replay was questionable. We didn't have it then, obviously, but she got a triple on her first hit and they called it foul, fine and dandy. She could easily fold it. And 
you know, that, that could have went differently, but she stuck to it. She took a breath. She went back at it and she hit a double. So, I mean, she proved it, you know, they say the ball doesn't lie and she had the opportunity to do that. But I mean, just the growth of that at bat just was, you know, it showed me like where our whole team was in terms of growing. So um, Riley Love played almost every game at shortstop last year. She's doing a great job. She's been working on her offense quite a bit. Um, she's just, it's been so fun to see her grow and really be comfortable here. Um, Pecan Villa, uh, she's done a great job. She's played second base for us quite a bit. Um, but I mean, that class alone, they got a lot of playing time last year and uh, just a lot of, I don't know, they grew together quite a bit. So really excited about that. Got a lot of new faces on the roster. How will the chemistry, what's the key to chemistry? We have a lot of new faces blending in with the returners. What's the key to building that chemistry with a roster that's pretty divided, like with youth and some experience? I think they've been working on it since day one. Um, a lot of the transfers came in and uh, did some summer school here. So they were able to acclimate, get to know the team. And there's really no divisiveness. It's a lot more cohesive of a group than it was, you know, previously here. So they're doing that on their own because they valued that. They felt like that's what our program needed and they've been putting in that work. So they really enjoy each other. I've got some really good feedback, um, you know, especially from the returners saying, I am enjoying this so much. I really love our team camaraderie right now. And this is exactly what I had always hoped for in a college experience. So, you know, I think we're in a really good spot for that right now. Do you sense, you know, I always talk to coaches, especially when they take over a program in their first year, that that first year, the transition is, is always, you know, tricky because the players are learning the coaches the coaches are learning the players so there's always that tentative whereas by that second year they kind of know each other and they kind of know how things are working and there's a more comfort level which as a result brings more kind of a a, a better I don't say a better atmosphere it just seems like everybody's more comfortable there is that a, do you is that accurate yeah I think so I think the reality is is that real relationships take time to build and so we've had time to build those. Um, so what comes with that is actual trust. And people think that you can just like people off the bat and you're good to go. And that's at the peer level and every level. But the reality is you have to kind of go through some adversity together and work through it together to really build solid, long lasting relationships. And so we've been able to do that. And um, I, like I said, I'm really pleased with where we are with our team camaraderie and everything. We're in a good spot. Um, we're doing this together, and that's really important. We we have this thing here where we say everyone counts or no one counts. So we hold true to that. We don't believe in hierarchy. We don't believe well freshmen have to carry the equipment and stuff like that. We need everyone here. So everyone counts or no one counts. You obviously got some transfers. You also have some freshmen. Uh, I want to start with the freshmen. Who are some of the freshmen names that Texas Tech fans could kind of be on the lookout for? Plus. I'm curious, had you kind of had to, you know, get familiarized with yourself with the freshman class? Because I've had coaches on the show have talked to me about because of the social distancing and a lot of virtual meetings over the last year or two, that they've kind of had to re, you know, kind of re get to know their freshman classes and the freshmen's coming in all over again, in a way. Is that is that kind of similar here? I mean, I think that's always I mean, it's kind of always the case, whether you have these things or not in terms of COVID. Um, you know, we didn't recruit every single player in our freshman class, but we would have, and we had the opportunity to get to know them and start building those relationships and stuff. So we're really glad that they're here. Um, we recruited some of them, you know, and uh, we've been able to build those relationships, but they're all the same. They're all ours. You know what I mean? They're all Texas Tech players. So um, I think some of the names, um, we've got three pitchers that I think are going to be really exciting to watch um, in their careers here. So um, you got Maddie Keel, she's from Colorado. You got Erna Carlin, she's from Texas. And then you got Rancy Willis, also from Texas. And all three of them have some great stuff to offer. Um, great ability, great mentality, and they're excited and eager to grow every single day. So Brittany Miller is our pitching coach and she works with them um, five days a week right now. And she's really enjoying the growth that she she's seen in them and 
we feel pretty good to be really honest about our pitching staff. So that was a big question mark for me personally coming into this year, but with the three freshmen, with our transfers, with our returners, I think we're in a really good spot right now. You mentioned the transfers, two pitchers you have trans uh, that came is Kendall Fritz from Nevada and Olivia Reigns from Oklahoma. Two really strong arms there to add there to have some experience, especially Fritz at Nevada did some great things there. Talk about those two and with the immediate impact they're going to have on your team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Kendall definitely provides experience. Um, I think that's if you're looking at what we lack this year as a staff, it's like actual inning experience and Kendall has the most. So she's been able to get a lot of really tough um, batters out. Um, she's done a really nice job. You know, she did a really nice job at Nevada. She's going to do a nice job for us. Uh, she's got, you know, pretty decent speed, pretty decent movement, spins the ball real well. So uh, she's hilarious. She's really fun to be around and she's a Texas native. So I'm glad that she chose us. And um, Olivia has fit in just absolutely seamlessly with our team and our staff. Uh, she's got a lot of ability pitching wise and she's just a great young lady I've just really enjoyed getting to know her but um, the pitching staff is doing a I mean we believe in the whole staff mentality I think you have to nowadays and so we really believe that we can use any of our pitchers at any time we're not going to have to ride one or two which is really exciting but they've been really taking it upon themselves because we're still in our individual segment of our season right now so we haven't even got to team practice yet but our pitchers and catchers have been taking the initiative on their own to you know, do things on a weekly basis. Like they do like, a, they had like a get together where they made different kinds of dips and stuff like that. Um, but they're doing stuff on a weekly basis just to build those relationships together. And you mentioned you have one returner, obviously uh, back in the staff with this deep of a staff, you mentioned you, you know, by committee, you're not, you know, you can certainly do that. You have more depth arms. Who do you kind of, with a young staff, a staff like this kind of get coming together, do you have a leader on that pitching staff? Is there, is it one of the vet, you know, that can lead by either by example or be a vocal leader to help out there in the bullpen? Well, I think the reality is Brittany is our leader and she's our pitching coach and she's our leader. So she's able to say what she wants to say to each one individually. She gives them collective messages, team messages, and she's bringing out their leadership ability within them. So, um, you know, we have a graduate assistant this year, Chris Aviramontes, um, who's helping us out as well. So she's been spending a lot of time with Brittany in the bullpen doing charting and things like that. Um, but, you know, when we talk, I'm like, right now, this semester with so many people being new, Brittany's voice needs to be the voice that's heard in there. So everyone needs to be eyes open, ears open and picking up all the knowledge there that our former All-American pitcher and pitching coach that's, you know, helped so many great pitchers. Uh, with you know pitchers of the year and things like that we need to listen to her and be learning I mean Brittany's biggest thing is mentality and that's what made her great as a pitcher let alone her nasty rise right ball but um, you know her mentality is one of the greatest things about her and for her to be able to speak that way um, I think is huge right now in my opinion a lot of pitchers are so caught up in being perfect and getting the mechanics right and certain things like that that if Brittany can take their mentality to another level, we that can be an equalizer for a lot of people. So I think that's an area where most people in today's day and age can grow. And Brittany does a great job of bringing that on pitchers. I've seen her do, do it time and time again. So I would say Brittany is our leader in the bullpen. But at the same time, the pitchers we have on the staff and can lead at any time. And that's what we want from them. Right. And you have some versatility in that staff. And of course, Brittany Miller was uh, recently inducted into the Orange County Softball Hall of Fame and uh, class over there. And obviously had a great college career uh, as well as an all Big Ten performer in Iowa. So the credentials there, I think players take notice of that. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, they should. <laughs> I mean, she worked her tail off to get where she did. And I mean, to hear her story and to hear her own personal growth within her career, um, it's inspiring. And, you know, if anyone has the ability to do great things, if they're going to commit to it, and she's the example of that. Let's talk about uh, the offense and some of the new faces, obviously, some you're very familiar with. Uh, talk about the offense and the new faces and the impact you expect from them. Um, you know, I'm pretty excited about our offense. We hit, um, for our individuals today, we hit live on the field, and Chris is through BP, and Chris is still a young buck, so she throws from 43 feet and throws spin, which I think is great, but I'm old and Brittany's old and we don't do that anymore. So it's really nice to have Chris out there. Um, 
so, I mean, she's literally challenging the hitters. And I think we've been doing this maybe three weeks now. And just to see the growth in all of our hitters has been really, really exciting. So I'm um, excited about, you know, we only have two ladies that are losing their eligibility this year. So we're young, which is also really exciting. But one of those is Molly Grumbo, who's a gra graduate transfer. Um, she came from Loyola Marymount. And Molly's a very consistent hitter. She's got sneaky power because she's little, um, but she's done a really nice job. Um, Carson Armijo from UCLA. She's a Texas native also. She has a ton of power. So really excited about the offense she's going to help us with. Uh, we got Ry Riley Ellen also from LMU. Big, strong kid, has had great success against some top pitching earlier in her career. Um, Paige Mendehall, also from LMU. She's doing a really good job. She hit a shot 270 today in BP off Carissa. So that was pretty nice. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of transfers that are helping us out. And then our returners are doing a really good job, too. Um, we've got a double fence on our field. And Riley Love likes to park shots over our double fence right now. So pretty excited about her offense coming along. But we, I'm excited about the opportunities and the possibility. And I don't see this team as being, you know, having nine players that we're going to play day in and day out. I think people are going to have opportunities to contribute and be a part of the, our success all year long. And I think that's exciting. Feels you've got some depth and versatility, right? You can move some players around if you have to, to fit them into lineups, maybe a little bit more options than you, you probably would, you, you've had. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of our recruiting philosophy as well. As well. We believe in um, choosing ball players first and not really looking at the positions because we want the best nine hitters on the field and we want them to be able to play and we want to be able to operate and, you know, move them however we need to to fit them into the lineup. So we do. We we definitely believe in ball player first, position specific second for that versatility. You mentioned some of the players that coming over, like a Fritz and others that are Texas native. And I bring that up because I remember when you got hired, that was a question that people asked. And it was a question I asked you when you got hired about being able to bring Texas kids to Texas Tech because you were coming from California. Clearly, early on, you're, you're showing that you can, you're bringing talent from the Texas from a high school level and from a transferring standpoint, there's that attractiveness. And I think that's also very, very worth pointing out there. Yeah, I mean, we, we wanna be real conscious of that. We wanna keep the best talent we can in the area and keep it here and you know, either get it to Lubbock or keep it in Lubbock. Um, but furthermore, I think, like I had said originally, when you and I talked about that a long time ago, like we wanna be able to find the best talent everywhere. So we are not gonna pigeonhole ourselves into any location we want the best players to come and play at Texas Tech, period, no matter where they're from. No doubt. Uh, you look at your defense. What, do you, what, what are your, some of the things you're looking as you get, get, get going here in the fall that you want to see from the defense? Because I know you're going to try some different things in different positions, but what are some of the keys specifically you've kind of identified like, all right, I want to see how this goes in the fall because this is very important to make our defense good. Well, in all honesty, everything we do in practice, we try to be as representative as possible to the game. So we don't, we are not people that believe in drills. And so I think like we're, like I said, we're very representative at the game. So we try to give like our hitters as much moving ball opportunity to hit. And then we like to give our defense as much ball off the bat um, to read um, every type of play they're going to be able to see. So we really just like to give them a lot of experience and I'm liking what I see right now. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays is when we do our defensive individuals. We have our infield go for a certain amount of time and then our outfield go after them and they just see a ton of balls off the bat. So, um, you know, last year we were, our defensive statistics were really pretty strong. You know, I think in the end it got a little, you know, we were, top 10 in the country I think or something like that for quite a while we were doing a really nice job so our defense is going to be good I think just the way we we prepare and our um, athletes playing free they can make a lot of things happen so uh, I'm pretty confident in what our defense will do and we have a lot of versatility we can move them around how we need to and they're not afraid of that they're ball players we are speaking with Texas Tech head coach Sammy Ward here on In the Circle. We talked earlier about you learning about the Big 12. Well, we're all learning now about the Big 12. It's been an interesting uh, time now in the Big 12. 
with college athletics in general, with obviously Oklahoma and Texas apparently moving on to the SEC down the road. And moving into the Big 12 is UCF, Houston, and a program you know very well is BYU. And I want to start with BYU aspect, and we'll get into the others later, because nobody probably knows Gordon Eakin and BYU better than you from your time at Loyola Marymount. That was an incredible rivalry in the West Coast Conference. I'm curious your reaction when you heard that BYU was coming to the league and that Gordon is coming in the Big 12. Honestly, I was really excited. When I got this job, um, Gordon reached out to me and he said, congratulations, you earned it. And he said, I'm sure going to miss competing against you. And then sure enough, he's joining us. And so I reached out to him. Can't wait to compete against you again. He called me. We talked on the phone and he's like, Sammy, I've been waiting for this for a long time. And I'm like, you earned it, man. Like, I'm happy for you. And I'm happy to compete against them. They always have a great program. So I'm looking forward to it, as always. Did you tease him like, man, you just keep following me. You're just following me wherever I'm going, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so just give me your thought. I mean, this is so fascinating. You, know, you got UCF, uh, which I know you're friends with Coach Ball Malone at UCF. Houston, obviously, from the state with Coach Vasley. And then BYU, just your thoughts on them coming in and then Oklahoma and Texas uh, leaving. Because obviously that's one of the hot topics in college athletics. It goes beyond softball, but it does affect softball. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, everyone looks at it, you know, from the football perspective. And while that's fine and dandy, that doesn't necessarily affect us directly, um, except for maybe monetarily. But I think adding um, Central Florida and Houston and BYU, they make our conference stronger right now. If they're, I'm not exactly sure, you know, when the changes are going to happen for certain, but if they're in here at the same time as Oklahoma and Texas, and this is going to be a really, really strong conference. So, um, I know Cindy does a great job at UCF. They've got their program moving in the right direction. They're super competitive. Can't wait to add them. Um, we're, you know, we're not really losing much with losing the other two. When you add someone like UCF, they've done a great job. Cindy's done a great job there. Houston has always had a great program. They're consistently doing really well. And then we know BYU has gone postseason eight million years in a row. So they're a competitive program as well. So, I mean, softball wise, it's still going to be a really competitive conference. Um, you know, best of luck to Oklahoma and Texas. The softball programs didn't have any choice in making the move, but, you know, good for them if, if that's what their schools want to do and that's what's best for them. Uh, you know, I wish nothing but the best for them as well. Well, and the exciting thing, I know Coach Pinkerton, when we had him on here recently, mentioned this. You're bringing three strong programs in softball that's been to the NCAA tournament consistently. Now the league is at eight teams in softball. From a scheduling standpoint, how does, will that affect you there from that standpoint, potentially, where now you're at an even number of teams, even instead of that having that odd number of teams, from mm -hmm. a scheduling standpoint, will help your resume and everything like that? Yeah, I really think it should. I think it's, you know, only positive and only going to help us. And, you know, I'd like to see all of us, you know, in the big 12, make it to the postseason and be in regionals and, you know, hosting and all those things. So I think it helps us for sure. Yeah. I don't think there's any reason why it can't still be a number three, a top three, top four art league uh, as far as the RPI is concerned in the sport, that's not going to change uh, just from a geography standpoint, maybe a little bit, but you've got it. Like I said, you've played these teams before, you know, Gordon very well and BYU, I feel like that's going to be like, that would be the fitting matchup this that you guys play the first time in the conference. I feel like that has to happen. I'm making that request for anybody <laughs> listening in the league. Yeah, I, mean, I can't believe you and Gordon are back in the same league. I mean, that's unbelievable. Know, it's pretty exciting. Me. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's so funny because I was like, oh, I can't wait for you to get here. And he's like, Sam, I, mean, I hope I don't get there. And I was like, holy crap, Gordon. <laughs> it's a little bit I, morbid, but I hope you don't either. <laughs> I mean, you might be like one of the, when, you know, they joined the league, a lot of big 12 coaches might reach out to you for advice of where to go in Provo. You've been, I mean, I know Glenn and Beeler was just there last season, but I don't think anybody's taken more trips to Provo than you have with your career at Loyola Marymount. Yeah, very possibly. It's beautiful up there. The mountains are just absolutely beautiful. They have a beautiful facility. Um, just the the way their outfield overlooks the mountains is just it's gorgeous there it's it's a nice town i mean provo is a really nice area you'll like orlando too by the way just for the record you'll like orlando I'm, i know i will i'm looking forward to it absolutely i think the staff there will uh, set you up to where you need to go there uh another beautiful place is clearwater 
And the recently was announced at the St. Pete Clearwater Invitational, a 15-team field. You're a part of that field. Just talk about being a part of that tournament, which has grown and is returning after a year off, obviously. But it's a marquee tournament. And you're also going to be at Mary Nutter, which is the other marquee tournament. I you're in the two top marquee tournaments, arguably, in the sport of softball right now. That's high praise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our whole goal here is we have to build our resume to be considered, you know, for an at-large in the postseason, and we do that in the preseason. So um, the schedule of teams at Clearwater or, you know, the committed teams, like those are great, great teams. So we had the opportunity to choose how many games we wanted, and I think we had the choice from anywhere from four to six, and I chose six, and that sounds crazy, and I know it's crazy, but it's going to be such a great opportunity for our young team. It's going to provide us so much experience and so much opportunity that I couldn't pass it up. And it's going to be a huge moment weekend of growth for us. Well, and, and Mary it's, Nutter, they're going to have great yeah. teams too. So, yeah. I mean, we're going to play at least five games there and we're going to compete against everyone we can. Well, and look, it's going to get you ready for conference play. So you'd rather be prepared than, you know, come in there and be surprised, especially for some of the newcomers. I think to play a tough non-conference schedule, will I, I've always felt, will set you up for success in conference, especially when you're in a league like the Big 12. Absolutely. I mean, you can't take any weekends off anyway, but, um, you know, I think the experience we had at LMU, knowing that we really had to take care of stuff preseason to even have a chance at being a two-bid conference, um, it prepared us as coaches for playing the tough schedule all year long, you know, like we're doing here. So, that's always been our mentality. If we want to be the best, we got to play the best and we got to beat the best. So we have to put ourselves in the, in the position to have that opportunity to do so. You've been at Mary Nutter before. Uh, describe what is it like to be a part of that scene? Uh, because that's going to be a big storyline in softball in 2022. Obviously they were out for a year and I think the West coast kind of missed it. I think the, the talking to a lot of people out West, they now appreciate that tournament more than ever before. Uh, and I think Clearwater will be the same, but just the history of Mary Nutter, what's it like to be a part of that tournament? I think it's so special. I mean, being there in Southern California, there's so many young softball players that come and watch that tournament. They're going to watch our collegiate student athletes and be in awe of them. And they're trying to get autographs and get pictures. And it's such a cool experience for the young athletes um, who are going to watch and our current athletes who get to understand the impact that they have in this game and and the understand the impact they have on little eyes watching them all the time. So it's really special. I mean, it's competitive. Um, it's, you know, nice location and it's just a lot of fun. Yeah. I think a lot of fans will appreciate I, I'll be curious to see the turnouts for these tournaments this year. I have a feeling we could have a bigger turnouts. I mean, coach, I mean, across the country, the fall, people are turning out in groves. I mean, Oklahoma is selling out fall ball. I mean, that was unheard of like a few years ago. Now I think softball, I think because of what's gone on the last year, people appreciate it more. And I feel like fall ball now in softball is kind of becoming like spring is in football where a lot of people go out to spring games. You've obviously experienced that since being at Texas tech. I feel like we're getting that now in softball. Oh, I agree. And our, our sport is deciding to watch anyway. I think people really take note. I mean, the, you know, playing on ESPN and getting the viewership that we get, I think it really opens a lot of people's eyes who maybe weren't familiar with softball before. So, I mean, it's not that surprising because it is such an amazing game. It's just now people are being able to recognize it because it's being aired so much more. And with the help of ESPN plus and things like that, like it's super exciting. All the opportunities we have to showcase our game. Last thing before we let you go, obviously, as you can begin the fall and the players and you put them in position and all these things, and then, you know, before you know it, the season will start. What are some of the keys for your group between now and then uh, to accomplish and have success this upcoming season, accomplish your internal goals? What are some of the key factors you have to do? I just think the biggest thing is play free. I mean, I think that's it sounds very easy to do, but this is a, such a hard freaking game. And everyone on the outside has an opinion and everyone on the outside is like, what the heck? How come you only went two for three? And I was like, well, I went two for three. That's pretty darn good. Um, just kind of shutting those things out and play free and just play in the moment and try to win pitches. And I know all that stuff is cliche, but the team that can do that better is usually the team that wins. But 
it's really easy in this game of failure to spiral and let one mistake become two, three, four, five, instead of letting it go and move on to the next one. So even though we have um, some older returners and older transfers, we're still pretty darn young. So I think just allowing ourselves to grow and stay present um, will put us in the best chance to succeed. So we never ask our players for perfection because it's unattainable. We just ask them to be present, give everything they've got to this pitch, learn from it, and now let's do it again on the next pitch. So we're very process oriented here, but learning how to work that process, learning how to compete within that process, um, I think is where our focus is right now and where our focus will continue to be day in and day out, no matter what point of the season we're in. Well, we're looking forward to seeing your team in year two when it gets going in February, especially when you come to Clearwater, right, right in my neck of the woods. So I'm excited about that. Uh, but I know there's a lot of work between now and then, and uh, you'll get to it. Uh, but so I appreciate the time you taking the time. I know it's a busy time as you get set here in the fall and with your team and uh, good luck. And uh, we'll see you definitely down the road. All right. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it.